Right. Good morning, everyone. Morning to our students online as well. Uh, uh, can you just put the camera a little higher? Okay. So last class, we did chapter four, overcoming inhibitions. So we looked at we looked at the different inhibitions that we will face. Uh, when we talk about inhibitions, it basically means things that stop us from sharing the gospel, right? So what were some of them that we looked at last class? We looked at not knowing what to say while sharing the gospel, uh, feeling that nobody is interested in the gospel, fear of rejection or ridicule. People will say, what are you talking about? Right? And being ashamed of the gospel. My friends don't know I'm a Christian. Right? And fear of mixing with other friends, unsaved friends. People will feel that, okay, if I'm a believer uh, and people know that I believe in Jesus, what if nobody is willing to be my friend? That could be a fear. And then we have other excuses. It's not my responsibility. Let others do it. And uh, afraid of difficult questions. And these are all common inhibitions. All of us will face this. But the point is we overcome those inhibitions. Right? We overcome it. Now, all of us will go through failures in life. Nobody will say, OK, because I failed, I will not, I will not do this again. Right? You, we have to overcome our failures. We have to become strong. We have to, uh, you know, the word overcome means to, to gain victory in that area of our lives. Right? So let's go to chapter 5. How do we get started when we talk about sharing the gospel? Right? Number one is asking leading questions. Now, a sign of a good minister of God is to ask questions. Right? That's why, as teachers, we always say, no, any questions. Right? When you ask questions, it is you're opening up yourself to understanding. Who's the best example when we look at the Bible? Who asked a lot of questions? Who? Peter asked a lot of questions. Who else? Pharisees? OK. Who else asked a lot of questions? Come on, you should know. Like, very good questions he asked. Sorry? Yeah, somebody said something. Did Jesus ask good questions? Did Jesus ask questions? He did. Remember when Jesus, when they came to Jesus and said, should we pay taxes? What does he reply? Yes or no? What does he reply? You should pay taxes. He says, whose face do you see on the coin? He answered the question with a question. Second one, who do you say I am? Everyone is saying you're the Messiah. Is it true? What did Jesus respond? Who do you say I am? So asking questions opens up the person to why he's asking that question. Right? Learn to ask. Now, the, the first point here is leading questions. Don't ask random questions. What do you have for breakfast? That's not going to help. Right? Ask leading questions, right? Learn to ask good questions. And those questions should be surrounded to the topic that you're talking about. Right? So for example, you are you're, you know, trying to minister to a friend of yours, right? And he or she says, you know what, I've been having a very difficult time last week. Work was very difficult. At home, there was so much of problem. Uh, I don't have strength in my body. I, I, I couldn't do anything. I'm feeling very weak. I feel like giving up. Right? Now, the, now, a good thing to do is you ask them why. Ask questions. What happened during the week? So they keep explaining. Right? So what did you do when you were tired? Now, the, the, most, the basic thing that we normally do is, OK, you know, you get up early morning. You look to Jesus. And then you drink some good energy drink, and you eat breakfast well, and right? all kinds of medical uh, reasons we can give. 
but learn to ask leading questions. So if somebody comes up to me and says, you know what, I had a very difficult time. I felt like, you know, just giving up my job and staying at home. So the first thing I'll ask them is, what happened? Then I'll ask them, what did you do when you were tired? When you wanted to give up, what did you do? Did you go to the gym? Did you eat? Did you want to sleep? What did you do? So they'll, they'll tell us right, what they wanted to do. And then it gives you an opportunity to bring in the gospel. So you can say, hey, you know what I did when I was tired, when I wanted to give up? This is what I did. Right? So you're opening up the person. Ask leading questions. We, we sometimes think it's more important to say things, to answer questions. Yes, it's good to answer questions. But sometimes it's good to ask a question back to a question that is asked. Right? We must understand that when sharing the gospel, it is not only about us talking. It is about us listening also. Right? It is very important to listen to people. Now, don't be in a hurry while sharing the gospel. Oh, Jesus died on the cross. He will forgive all your sins. If you're going through depression, you're going through suicidal tendencies, you want to kill yourself, don't do it. Jesus is with you. Don't, don't talk too much. Always be willing to listen first. Don't look at it as, okay, one more person can become a believer. No. Listen to people. Listen to what they say. Did Jesus listen when people came and shared their thoughts with him? Yes, he did. Right? The mistake we make is, I want to talk. I want to share. I want to do this. I want to tell about all the examples from the Bible. There will come a time for that. But initially, be willing to listen. Don't look at it as an argument, a debate. Be willing to listen. This requires patience. Right? We must be patient. The person may start telling about their grandfather, what happened from their grandfather's time, then their father's time, then their neighbor, then their health, everything they'll be talking about. We must be willing to listen. Right? Now, I know that you know in a time that we are in, everyone are busy. Right? But when we listen, it's like giving importance to the person. Right? Look at children as well. right? When I talk to my children, they want my attention. So sometimes I'll be working on the laptop, they'll be talking to me, they will not talk. I say, you're not looking at me, you're not listening. You listen, then I will talk. Right? And they need that attention. How much more people you're sharing the gospel with? Right? Learn, learning about the person's perspective about his past will help us to minister the gospel. Now, if this person is from another faith, maybe a Hindu or a Muslim, Buddhist, whatever faith he's from, learning about his past will help you ask the right questions. So for example, there's a, a person, maybe your friend, is, a, is from an Islamic faith, is a Muslim. right? Now, you know that. So what are the good questions you can ask? You can ask, hey. So on Fridays, you go for prayer. How do you feel after prayer? Simple question. You're not mocking him. You're not uh, saying, you know, your prayer is not good. My prayer is stronger. You're not saying all of that. You're saying, hey, I know that, you know, Fridays you'll go for prayer. And, you know, in the afternoon you'll close down your business and go. I really appreciate that. What are you doing? You're appreciating the person. Right? And then that person begins to talk. Why don't you tell me about, you know, I've heard that, you know, Muslims share or pray five times a day. What do you pray? What is the morning prayer? What is the, you know, first prayer, second prayer? What do you pray about? Ask about it. Or if you're talking to a Hindu, there are many questions we can ask. Now, when we ask those questions also, we must be very wise in the way we ask questions. Don't ask in a condescending way. Uh, tell me, what do you pray today? Huh? Did, you did your prayer get answered? 
Yeah, that's because you're not praying correctly. That's that's the wrong way to speak, right? You ask in a way that you want to know the person and you want to help that person, right? Find out about his past. Find out if he has the person has any knowledge about Jesus. Very important. Now there will be people from other faiths who know about Jesus. And there are people who don't know about Jesus. There are people who know about the miracles of Jesus. Some of them, if you if you talk to a Muslim, they know about Jesus. Right? They know he's a prophet. They know that he's a man of God. God sent him on this earth. They know all of that. So then, you know, when you're ministering to a Muslim or a, you know, and later on we'll talk about how to minister to a Muslim and a Hindu and other people from other faiths. But here's the point. So you know you're talking about Jesus. You, this person knows it. But what about a Hindu? He may not know. So you need to understand, okay, this person doesn't know about Jesus. So I have to start from the scratch. Okay, so who is Jesus? What is the significance of Jesus? So, you know, we were all living in sin. Right? This is what sin does to us. God decided that he was going to come into this world and save us from this sin. And he came as a man. Now, as you're sharing this message, you may think, Will he believe or not? Will he believe or not? That is not our responsibility. What did we see in chapter 1? Every person needs a believer. We also looked at, you know, when you're sharing the gospel, it is the power of God, not the power of man. It's the power of God unto salvation. So God will work. You just share the gospel. Right? So try to understand if the person has any knowledge. So there are times I've spoken to people from other faiths. They know a lot about Jesus. They know the miracles about Jesus. They may not believe in Jesus, but they know the miracles. They know that he did these things. And then there are times when people from uh, other faiths, I, I remember speaking to a couple of Buddhists once, uh, many years back, speaking to this, these Buddhists, they said, oh, we love Jesus because he, he carried the certain values of peace. Right? He, he was a very peaceful man. Uh, the way he talked to his people, he loved. So if you look at Buddhism, Buddhism is all about peace, right? Inner peace. Finding that, uh, that place of inner peace is what Buddhism is all about. Oh, we love Jesus because Jesus was a man of peace. He said, I'll give you peace. But do they know? They know about Jesus, but do they know Jesus? No. But it gives you an opportunity to share and ask the right questions. When you're sharing, share it with wisdom. And this will come over time. Right? You will learn as you keep doing it. Now, there are different levels of conversation uh, in, in terms of asking questions. right? So first question we can ask is, what do you do? So for example, your, uh, you know, your, a friend of yours comes and shares with you, hey, um, I want to quit my job. I want to, you know, I'm finding it very difficult. I'm looking out for a new job. What are you going to say? Right. First thing is, what happened? What, what, what do you do in your office? What, what is the job that you do? Right? Or if it's you know, in a town setting, if people come and say, you know, I want to uh, become a teacher or I want to become a doctor. Right? So you ask good questions. Why do you want to become a doctor? What is it that you want to do, right? Then, where did you study? Right Now, look at this example. Let's open to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Let me just let me just get that verse, Matthew four. Sorry, let me just get the verse. Oh, sorry, I, I think it's John chapter. John four is the chapter. 
Okay, yeah, Matthew 4. Let's look at that portion. Uh, uh, verse 18. Yeah, verse 18 to 22. Let's read that, 18 to 22. And Jesus, walking by, uh, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Yeah. Now, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 5. Sorry, not... Yeah, Luke 5. Again, it's the same portion. We don't have to read it. So here, Pete Jesus sees Peter, right? Peter and Andrew, two brothers. Now, Andrew was the disciple of uh, John the Baptist, right? And he sees them and he requests them, can I come into your boat and preach? And we see the response after that, both of them, because, you know, they follow Jesus. They leave their nets and follow Jesus. Now, there's another portion when we read, we see that Andrew goes and finds Peter. And he says, Peter, we have found the Messiah. Come and see him. Right? So what happens here is you see a ripple effect. The word ripple effect means uh, uh, you've seen the seas, right? How the water goes, right? The waves just go that way. And then it continues on, right? It doesn't stop. It's called a ripple effect. This same thing happens when Jesus calls his disciples. The disciples call others. Others have questions. They were able to minister and they all pointed to Jesus. So it's very important when we are ministering, we find time to hear, to question, to, to reason with people. Right? Some of the things that you can ask is, what do you do in your free time? What are your hobbies? Right? Now remember, while sharing the gospel, it's not only about giving revelations and the, you know, the great wisdom of God. It's not only about that. We need to be practical also. Was Jesus practical in the way he did his ministry? Or only was he saying, I'm the son of God, I'm the Messiah? Did he keep saying that? I came from heaven. There is no one as holy as me. Did he say all of that? No. If you look at his ministry, it was very practical. Some places he knew, okay, this is what I have to do. Right? He didn't fly and go from one place to another. He knew he had to go by boat or by walk and it takes time and I have to go, right? So there are times when we use these simple questions, practical questions. They need, they need not be something very super spiritual. It can be very simple, but it can minister to a person. It can really minister to a person. I remember many years ago, I was... Uh, I used to take these guitar classes. So I used to teach the guitar. And there were a couple of them, you know, my neighbors, they would say, okay, I also want to learn guitar. This is way back, right? So, okay, come. Learn. So now I knew that I had the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Right? They were not believers. So I knew I had the opportunity. But I, I couldn't expect them to come with a guitar first class and say, do you know Jesus loves you? Do you know Jesus can make you play guitar? The much better than anyone else. Can't do that. Right? So first, teach the guitar. That's their passion. So I would purposely make them learn Christian songs, easy songs. Right? And I, I would teach them the guitar. I would tell them, hey, why don't you practice this way? Right? So it was 
80% practical teaching of the guitar. 20% here and there I would bring in some things. Okay, so when you go home, what do you do? Yeah, my, my mom and dad are there. They will, uh, you know, I'll probably do my homework and, you know, I, I'll go out and play. Oh, what sport do you like? I play football. Oh, who's your favorite player? So now what is happening? There's nothing spiritual about this. So he's opening up. He's telling. So I know that he won. I know he's, his, his parents are at home. I know that he's, you know, good in his studies. I mean, he's probably interested in study. So he wants to go home and do his homework. Three, I know his favorite sport is football. And I know he likes guitar. I know that he can sing. So I'm getting to know the person. Right? Then I ask, hey, why don't we have uh, classes on Sunday evening? No, can I come Sunday morning? No, Sunday morning I go to church. What do you do on Sunday morning? You see that how the questions have been asked? Leading questions. Or you can ask, what do you do on Sunday morning? Sunday morning, oh, uh, Sunday is my holiday. I wake up late. I spend time at home. I enjoy. I go out with my friends. OK. Now immediately don't say, OK, you have to go to church. Jesus loves you. All of that. No. You need to be wise. Right. OK, this is what you do on Sunday. So you're free on Sundays. He'll say, yes, I don't do anything. So why don't you come with me? We have a nice uh, you know, worship. We call it worship where they have music. So that, Because I already know, what does he like? Music. We have a full band that's playing. They're singing songs to Jesus. And they have drums, guitars, vocal, vocals, and keyboard. It's a full band. Why don't you come and experience? Now, because he's interested in music, 95% of the time they will say yes. Right? They'll, they'll say, okay, I'll come. I want to see the music. Right? And it also gives me an opportunity because I know that he is, he likes football. So what I can do, I'll say, hey, we have our youth meeting coming up. After the youth meeting, they all join and they play some games, football and cricket and badminton. Why don't you come? Oh, yeah, I love football. I'll come. So what's happening? In the day, day one, first or second meeting, I've got to know what he likes. He doesn't know anything about me. But I have asked questions so that I get to know him. Right? That's a youth meeting. OK, I'll come. So he stays for the youth meeting. He may be coming to play football, but he, has to, he may have to sit through the whole youth meeting. He'll sit there. But he enjoyed the football the most. Now, when you finish the meeting, don't go back to him and say, did you, did you, you know, hear anything from what was uh, preached on that youth meeting? No, you can, but take your time. Right? So you understand what I'm saying. Right? So there are times when there was another person I know, of, uh, he really liked computers. He wanted to learn computer. So I said, see, I'm not so good in all of that. I can do it. I can teach you the basics. But I have a friend who can teach you. Right? And he can teach you all of these you know, technical stuff in the computer. Why don't you go to him? So I connected him. And then he was able to minister the gospel to this person. How is it all done? Asking questions. Asking questions. Asking the right questions at the right time. Right? OK. So next way is getting to know their belief system. We talked about this, right? One of the questions we can ask is, see, we, there are people who are spiritual in life, right? Whatever faith we are in, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christians, any faith, people are spiritual and people don't care. So you'll have Hindus who don't believe in God at all. No, I, I'm not interested in all that. You'll have Christians who are not interested. But then on the other side, you will have Hindus who really believe. Right? They are very spiritual. Every Wednesday or every Friday, they go for prayers. Right? Then you have people who are Muslims. Some of them believe, some of them don't care. Hey, I don't believe in all that. Right? So by nature, some of them are very spiritual. Some of them, are, no, I don't care. I don't believe in all this. All gods are one. Done. Right? Now, so the number one question we can ask is, do you consider yourself as a spiritual person? Hey, I, I heard that you, know, you are a Muslim or a Hindu. So do you consider yourself spiritual? What do you understand? Now, many a times, people may not understand their own scriptures. Right? 
the, the Quran or uh, the Vedics, the Vedas, they may not have understood, they've not even read it. But they may say, hey, I, I don't consider myself spiritual. Right? So now again, you're getting to know the person. Right? Two, you can ask, have you ever been to church? What do you think about church? Now they may say, oh, church is a place I will never come. Now when you get that kind of response, say, okay, maybe you can ask, why not? Has it, has it, is it because you have come before, there was a problem? Is it because of that? Or is it because you, know, you feel that you're, that's not the place for you? Ask the right questions. Right? Then you can ask, what do you think about God? What do you think about afterlife? Right? After we die, what happens? It's a good question to ask. How many of you have asked that question to, to, to you know, people from other faiths? So, what do you think happens after you die? Nobody in this world will say, I will not die. Doesn't matter what is their faith. They will say, yes, death will come. And everyone believes something will happen after death. Right? Everyone will believe. Every human being will believe something will happen after death. So you ask them, what do you believe? Is that a good question to ask? It's a very good question to ask. They'll say, okay, I believe this. What do you believe? They'll ask. And you share the gospel. This is what I believe. Gives you an opportunity. Because you're not forcing yourself. They are asking you. Right? So, again, they're not trying to be, you know, uh, trying to, you know, make them feel like they're inferior or making them feel that, hey, you don't know anything. That's not what we're trying to make them feel. We are trying to get them to understand things from the gospel. Right? It's not to make them feel low. It's not like we are greater than them. No. Right? We just want them to know about the gospel. That's all our, our goal is. Right? Then you can invite them to uh, different occasions. You've got Good Friday, Christmas, uh, Easter Sunday, all of these special Sundays you can invite them. Healing Sunday, Youth Sundays. Invite them. Do you have all these things happening in your churches? Right? You'll have e Healing Sunday. Uh, I'm sure there'll be Good Friday service, obviously, will be there, Christmas service. I know that I think in certain villages and in towns they have you know, a good Christmas program, right? Two, three churches come together and you'll do a good Christmas program. So it's a great opportunity to invite people, right? You pray for them, invite them, and minister to them. Right? Now leave the result up to God. You don't worry, oh, I invited, they didn't become believers. Don't worry. Right? The seeds have been sown. God will do a work. Our responsibility is to invite them. Right? Now, the second approach is the prayer approach. Everyone say prayer. Prayer. Acts chapter 4 and verse 9. Prayer is the most powerful approach that we can use. Acts 4, verse 9. Sorry, Acts 4, 29. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Yeah. Now, the previous, what has happened is, Peter and John, they go and they speak in great boldness. They speak about Jesus, about the Messiah. And the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees are saying, we are going to make sure that you're not going to talk about Jesus again. We'll make sure that we stop this Christianity, this whole thing that you all are doing, saying that Jesus is the Messiah. So they were, you know, we know that the early church went through a lot of persecution. What did they pray? They did not pray, God, remove the persecution. They prayed, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. The next verse says, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles and signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. Right? 
persecution was going to come. They didn't say, God, stop the persecution. They said, God, give us the boldness to face the persecution. Right? So first things first, when we begin to minister the gospel, whether we are pastors, evangelists, prophet, apostle, teacher, whatever we are, right? It doesn't matter. Take the prayer approach. When we pray, God gives us boldness. You see these people, the disciples, the early church, they prayed and God gave them the boldness. Was there persecution? Intense persecution. It's not like what we are seeing now. During that time, it was death. If they caught them, they were killed. But what did they say? They prayed, Lord, give us boldness. So the prayer approach is the best approach. Pray, ask God, God, give me the boldness to share the gospel. Give me the boldness to know that, okay, when I'm sharing, you are there with me. There are times when, you know, I've shared the gospel and people have crowded up against me. Sometimes it, we become fearful. Oh man, today something's going to happen. But God gives us the boldness because we have prayed. And even through those challenges, even through those persecutions, God enables us, God equips us, God strengthens us, right? So another way of in prayer approach is you find out what is their difficulty. Is there anyone in this world who doesn't have a difficulty? Nobody. The first thing you ask, now we all have prayer requests, right? Even believers' prayer requests are longer than the unbelievers, right? But we all have prayer requests. Pray for this, pray for this, right? So ask them. Hey, I heard your mother is unwell. Yeah, my mother's in the hospital. What is the first thing you do? Don't say, you know, drink glucose in the morning, morning, afternoon, night, have good food. All of that the doctor will tell. What do you tell? What can you tell? Hey, can I pray for you? Do you think this person is going to say, tell me who you're going to pray for? You're praying for to who you're praying. You think he's going to ask for him? My mother should get out of the hospital and be all right. That's all. You pray to whoever you want to pray. Right? Yes or no? You pray to whoever you want. I want my mother to get well and come out of the hospital. So you can tell them, hey, I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. Right? You know I'm a Christian. You know I believe in Jesus. I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. And when I pray, expect that God can bring healing. Now this person will say, no, I don't expect God to heal. Will he say that? No, because... He wants his mother out, wants his mother to be healed. And this is an approach we can directly take. Right? We don't have to explain the gospel for that. You get what I'm saying, right? The situation is, or what if there's somebody on the deathbed or somebody, you know, I remember this many years ago, uh, this mother came up to me and said, my son wants to commit suicide. He has tried two or three times commit suicide so somebody told me about you know the church and i don't know anything about church i don't know anything about jesus somebody told me out of desperation this mother came to church i right? said this is what it is my son has is a young boy he's i don't know what happens to him he's been trying to commit suicide two three times he tried somehow we you know he got his life got saved can you please pray for him? Now, will the mother say, don't pray in Jesus' name? She had come to church. So we prayed in Jesus' name. Right? We continued to minister to her. And over time, she accepted the Lord. And her son was all right as well. Right? So, so that you take that prayer approach. God, do this in her life. Is God willing to do it? Yes or no? God is willing to do it. Right. So that assurance we must have. Then you can ask for needs, job. People have financial needs. People have needs in the house. How many of you don't have any need? You have everything. All of us have some need or the other, right? So you can ask them, hey, can I pray for you? 
there was there'll be times when they need a a seat in a college medical college or they they need a a house to stay in they need a vehicle anything pray for them oh and it could be plans of career anything right so the prayer approach is is putting our faith into practice the other person may not have faith at all right but when we have faith we express that faith and ask god to bring healing to meet their needs remember that example where the friends of this paralyzed person right they open the ceiling and and they you know lower the board the person down the crippled person did he have faith did he have faith that jesus will heal him he didn't know what is happening he said okay the other four people had faith he was just there on the bed what about the the man who was uh, paralyzed for 38 years he didn't have faith and no i when when the water stirred up nobody is there to put me in the water jesus said i didn't ask you that do you have faith to be healed right, so sometimes it is not only about their faith so we can express our faith on their behalf he prayed say god you bring healing you bring healing do the supernatural in their life then god begins you know they can become believers they can accept the lord jesus because they know that only god can do it i remember 2012 or we went to varanasi i think i've used this example we were having a short term bible college in varanasi and in we were it was each of our staff would go there for one week and i had the opportunity to speak to some of the pastors right and this pastor was telling me all of them in the church 100% all of them were unbelievers none of them were christians all of them were unbelievers who came to the faith and so i asked him how did it happen he said all we did was we prayed for healing somebody's child had cancer somebody's child couldn't hear one child couldn't speak one one baby was died in the womb and he shared this testimony where a baby was dead in the womb and they prayed pastor prayed right and the baby started moving right now after giving birth this mother said there is no other god who can do this which other god can do i've i've been praying to many gods but there's no other god who can do this and after the baby is born she came to church became a believer you know child dedication happened in the church she's serving in the church because they went through a lot of challenges lot of problems because of the faith but in their heart nobody can do this no other god can do this my son was blind now he can see my my daughter could not was deaf now she can hear no nobody else did it and so i remember you know he was sharing the news channels came and said why have you become a christian why is it that you have let go of your faith and you become a christian because no other god can do this so in the news channel these people are giving testimony you know, my son was like this my daughter was like this only jesus healed so if you have any sickness so it was like free promotion right? but what happened was the church grew many people came to christ because of this right the prayer approach when people say yes pray the person has authorized us to invite god into their life they're also authorizing god they say okay jesus okay you pray to jesus so what is he doing he's opening his heart for jesus to work right uh, they will witness by hearing you pray they will witness how a personal relationship with god works i've always said this any other religion any other faith there is no personal relationship with god it's not a father son relationship no religion there's no personal relationship now when you and i pray and we say father i thank you that you hear my prayers i thank you that you love me i thank you that you care for me jesus you died on the cross for me imagine the person who's listening hey this person is talking to god in such a 
personal way. There's so much of love. And imagine you are crying and praying. It will touch them. They will remember it. They will think about it. They may not give their life to Christ immediately, but they will think about it. How come he has such a relationship? And how come he cried for me? I didn't cry for myself. But he cried for me and prayed for me. It will touch their lives. Right? Be open even when you're praying to have words of knowledge, to have the prophetic. Ask the Holy Spirit to minister. Right? Word of knowledge and prophetic. When you speak it over people's lives, especially those who are unbelievers, people from another faith, it touches them. Hey, how do you know this is the problem I'm going through? How do you know that this is what I went through? This is how, you know, uh, my family problem. How do you know it? Then it gives you an opportunity to share about Jesus. Right? Even the smallest thing, smallest, you know, opportunity is a way of bringing the gospel in. Right? Uh, the prayer approach could lead to opportunities, and then you and I can follow up, minister to them. And then you have the two minute testimony. We talked about this, right? Two minute testimony, your life before Christ, life after you met Christ, and how after you met Christ, your, your reasoning, your direction, your values, the things that you want to do, everything has changed in life. And then the power encounter approach. Right? Healing is a power encounter. So people say, I'm going through this problem. Pray and heal. God, I'm going to pray for healing. Then you have the word of knowledge. In John chapter 4, what did Jesus say? What happened in John chapter 4 in the Samaritan woman? Word of knowledge. I know that you're married. I know that you're right now, the person that you are staying with is not even your husband. I know that you're going through loneliness. I know that you've been looked down upon in society. Jesus spoke words of knowledge. And through that, she became, she believed. Right? What about prophecy? Prophecy, plenty of prophecies. Right? God can tell, speak to you through prophecies. Hey, you know what? You're going through this, but there'll come a time. God will open a door for you. And I think you want to be an engineer, you want to be a doctor, if that's what God wants you to do, here's what God has a plan for you. And this person will say, hey, how do you know I want to become an engineer? Or how do you know I want to become a doctor? Prophetic word. Power encounter, right? And then miraculous interventions, meaning suddenly this person may get a job. Suddenly this per uh, a person may, you're praying for them, suddenly they get a job. Suddenly they get an opportunity, right? Or they get healing, deliverance, right? Or supernatural providence of finances. All of a sudden, God can do that, right? Those are power and counter approach. And finally, the last portion is to take appropriate steps, meaning after you invite the person, if he's interested in, share, in knowing more about Jesus, connect them to a church, connect them to a cell group, uh, you know, connect them to leaders in the church so that they have that one-on-one -on -one fellowship, especially in the initial phases, right? And after they grow, you can let them be on their own, right? Uh, but that initial phase, connect them to church, be there for them. They will have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, you can connect them to the pastor or leaders of the church, right? And even when you're sharing, show genuine love and care, right? Love them, care for them. Uh, don't make it like a target, but love them. Don't be judgmental or criticize people. You know, the meaning of judgmental is uh, to judge a person. Okay. So when you pray, you know, you should pray like this. You don't have faith or you're not praying properly or uh, you're not reading the word. Right? You're not interested in anything about the scriptures. Uh, being judgmental. Right? You're not working hard. That's why God is not blessing you. That's being judgmental, right? Our goal is not to be judgmental, but to share Jesus with them, care for them, provide for them, disciple them, right? Uh, there'll be times when, you know, they'll be living in sin, drinking, smoking, living in sexual immorality, whatever they're living in. Don't look at the sin that they're doing and bring judgment on them. 
remember that we are also sinful. We have also sinned. Right? We were not perfect when Jesus forgave our sins. We all were also in sin. So when we look at them, don't judge them for their, what they are doing. If they are drinking and smoking, say, hey, you know what? God can change you. God can help you overcome. Right? Just pray. Ask God for strength. Ask God for the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. What are you doing? You care for them. If we don't care, if we're judgmental, now if you keep drinking and smoking, gone for you. God will bring a curse upon your life. That's what's that? That's being judgmental. Right? And avoid arguments. There are times we get into debates by people from other faiths, especially we may start debating with each other. You know, my God is better. This is, a, this, this is what my God says. Debates are good, but when the debates become a heated argument, close it. Don't start fighting. You see, Jesus did that, right? Certain times when they were going to attack him, he just walked away. Close the debate. You don't have to prove a point by winning an argument, right? Um, don't let people's negative response pull you down. Very important. Some people, when you share the gospel, they'll say, no, I don't believe in this. I'm sorry. I don't want to believe in your Jesus. Now, that's not the end of the world. Right? Move on. Okay. Continue with your life. Right? Some people may say, hey, don't talk to me about Jesus. I prayed for 10 years. Nothing happened. You know, I don't believe in your Jesus. I don't want to hear from you. Don't talk to me about him. If we may feel negative. We may feel down. Get up again. Right? Move on. Don't sit and think, oh, because of, I shared the gospel with him, he said something bad about Jesus. Now what will Jesus feel? Jesus is not worried. Right? We don't have to be worried. Just move on in life. Right? Stay strong. Stay in love. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. And then, uh, finally, our goal is while we share, uh, be natural. Let sharing the gospel be a lifestyle. Meaning. Wherever we are, right? uh, we could be outside, we could be meeting people, we could be in the mall, we could be meeting our friends. Wherever we are, let it be a natural thing. Right? Now, how does it become natural? When we practice it. Right? When we wake up in the morning, what do we do? Do we think, oh, what should I do today? Do we think that? No, we know. It's a natural thing. Get up, freshen up. Get ready, spend time in prayer, read the word, come sit for your classes. It's natural. Right? So sharing the gospel, the more we do it, the more natural it becomes. Yes or no? Right? So now with digital media and all of that that is there, you know what you can do? You can share a small message, two-minute clip, five-minute clip, or a Bible verse. Sending a Bible verse and, and the person may respond back, hey, thank you for this, but I didn't understand anything. What happens? It gives you an opportunity to share the gospel. It becomes a natural thing. You don't have to worry. You don't have to plan and prepare for 10, 10 15 minutes of what to share. It's natural. It just comes out naturally. Right? That's why the subject is called lifestyle evangelism. It becomes a lifestyle. Every day, whenever you get opportunity, able to do it right all right so let's close and we'll pick up from next week let's quickly pray right? father we thank you for this time we thank you for teaching us lord and even as we learn uh, lord we pray that you will continue to empower us and strengthen us and use us lord for your glory we thank you lord i pray a blessing over the students lord each one of them here and online I pray, God, that you will give each one of us opportunities to share the gospel, to minister to each other, not by our own wisdom and our own strength, Lord, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day ahead.